Frequent hurricanes, prolonged drought conditions, and increasing bushfires. These yearly occurrences are forcing us, even before we intended, to implement a strategic disaster resilient program. In today's show, Prime Minister Andrew Holness talks disaster management, and we find out how portable water gets into our homes. This is Jamaica Magazine, and I am Adrian Atkinson. Stay with us for an informative show. Good day, I'm Lorraine Mendez and this is your JIS News for Tuesday, July 24. Jamaica's financial outlook has been given a positive outlook rating by Moody's Investor Service, which is an upgrade from stable. The rating agency issued this statement on Friday while maintaining Jamaica's B3 long-term issuer ratings. According to Moody's, the key drivers for the positive outlook were ongoing fiscal consolidation and improvement of institutional capacity and policy effectiveness. In the release, Moody's says it believes Jamaica is likely to run sizable primary surpluses of about 7% of GDP and report broadly balanced fiscal accounts. Moody's also foresees the government's debt falling around 100% of GDP this fiscal year and anticipates further decline in subsequent years. It commends the Jamaican authorities for showing a strong commitment to fiscal consolidation. National Security Minister Dr. Horace Chang says government will be drawing support from MOCA and the counter-terrorism and organized crime CTOC to secure the country's border from illicit trade. I think as they assume they were the responsibility and they're fully staffed and given the required infrastructure they required, we'll be able to mitigate, the, not only mitigate the damage being done by illicit trade, but I think we'll get to a point we can prevent it almost totally. Dr. Chang was addressing the opening of a one-day anti-illicit trade conference hosted by Carreras Limited on Monday. In the meantime, he says measures are being put in place to strengthen border security, particularly the multi-million dollar counterfeit trade. But illicit trade generally is the biggest funder of criminal activity. We have to intercept the trades at this point. We are working with customs, Ministry of Finance to ensure customs not only train and prepare but have the required technology to assist in ensuring that we can maintain the legal entry points. Still on national security, over 100 private partners have joined the network of closed circuit television CCTV cameras being used for the Jamaica Eye Initiative. Launched in March this year, the program utilizes both private and government cameras to monitor public spaces. They are being used to capture incidents of crime, traffic crashes, natural disasters or other emergencies to make response more effective. The aim is to have coverage in specific areas. We use a, a GIS map uh, of Jamaica. We have the crime data overlaid on it. We have the, the accident data overlaid on it. And we're looking to establish coverage in those critical areas. Senior Director of Modernization and Strategic Projects at the Ministry of National Security, Arvel Grant, was addressing a recent JIS think tank. He's imploring more Jamaicans to become part of the movement and contribute to securing their own spaces by providing access to their personal CCTV feeds. Jamaicans traveling to the African country of Namibia for business or tourism will no longer require a visa. The country signed a visa waiver agreement on Monday. It followed the signing of a Memorandum of Understanding to facilitate cooperation in sports and political consultation. Plans are now in motion to secure deeper bonds through trade, investment, banking, education and culture. The developments come as Prime Minister Andrew Holness is on a state visit to Namibia, the first for a Jamaican sitting head of government. He has thanked Namibia for its continued support and partnership in groupings such as the African, Caribbean and Pacific States, ACP. We have signed cooperation agreements before. We have expressed our solidarity in words. The struggle for liberation has not ended. 
it has merely taken on a new phase. In this phase of the struggle, you say economic emancipation. We say economic independence. Both seek the pathway to prosperity. The presence here today is indicative of the cordial relationship that exists between our two countries and peoples. It presents an ideal opportunity to explore new areas of cooperation in our bilateral relationships, facilitate exchange of goods and services, and increase people-to-people -people interaction. In the meantime, Prime Minister Andrew Holness has expressed gratitude to the Namibian government for naming a street in its capital in honor of Jamaica's first national hero, Marcus Mazaya Garvey. He says the renaming demonstrates the valuable contribution Garvey has played in countering negativity towards black people in Africa and the diaspora. We in Jamaica are extremely proud, yet deeply humbled, that you have chosen to honor one of our own in this tangible way. This great gesture will undoubtedly create curiosity among future generations as they seek answers to the question, who was Marcus Garvey? And finally, the annual staging of the Christmas in July trade show continues to open avenues for networking and expanding business opportunities for local manufacturers. Now in its fourth year, the results have led to entrepreneurs signing contracts for the supply of corporate gifts and souvenirs. In welcoming the initiative, Industry and Commerce Minister Audley Shaw says government is committed to helping small businesses realize further success. Because we have to stop giving lip service to linkages. This year's staging involved 115 local producers displaying a variety of products. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Lorraine Mendez. Thanks for watching. The summer heat is raging. To make matters worse, the drought condition is not improving. Once more, we are reminded that water is life. Up next, the process undertaken to get the precious commodity into our taps. The human body cannot function without water. While you may live for up to three weeks without food, you cannot go more than a week without water. From breaking down the food we eat so the body can use it, to helping us heal when we get sick, water is needed for almost every process that takes place in the body. And although 70% of the Earth's surface is covered with water, drinking it directly from seas, rivers, wells, or aqueducts may make you sick. Untreated water contains bacteria and other germs, as well as chemicals that may be dangerous to the body. So in order to get the water from here to here safely, it has to be treated. Water treatment processes differ depending on the source. If the water is coming from a river, for example, here at the Negro River in St. Thomas, it usually goes through an extensive treatment process before reaching the pipe. Here is where we do the, the first type of treatment in the form of sedimentation and screening. Behind me, you can see where we screen the bigger stuff, like the stick, the stones and debris. Then we come down to the sediment where we separate the sand from the stones. And then this water will leave into, from St. Thomas and pipe into Kingston via pipeline into the Mona Reservoir. The Mona Reservoir is the island's largest raw water storage facility and provides the liquid to over 30% of people living in Kingston and St. Andrew. If this is where you get your water, here is where the next step in the treatment process occurs. Here in the reservoir, we allow for maximum levels of mixing, um, maximum levels of aeration, as can be done here at the facility. We also, at the reservoir, uh, you allow for settling out of the silt and the suspended particles, dirt particles, that would otherwise be in the uh, raw water. 
We then take the water from the reservoir and take it to the Mona treatment plant. At the treatment plant, chemicals are added to further purify the water. Chlorine is first added to kill bacteria. You have stages that include uh, uh, flocculation, where we actually add chemicals to the water that allow those microscopic dirt particles that are still in the water to be brought together in what we call flux and then we are able to skim it off and remove it from the water. The water is then passed through filters which contain layers of sand, gravel, charcoal or synthetic materials that remove remaining small particles. The final stage is disinfection. Here, chlorine is added to kill any other bacteria or germ. Ensuring that we have what we refer to as chlorine residual that goes with the water so that as the water travels along the pipeline to our customers, should it come in contact with any germs along the way, there is enough chlorine residual in that water to destroy those germs and still be delivered to the customer in good quality. The water is tested all throughout the treatment process to ensure that what you get in your pipe meets World Health Organization standards. For several years running, the National Water Commission has won the best tasting water in the Caribbean. We have also been acknowledged by the various arms of the United Nations at different points in time as uh, having one of the best quality water in the hemisphere. That is definitely something we can drink to. Water again. Water gone. But we need water for cook. So we go wash. Let's weather the drought. Start conservation measures today. Check for leaks around your house. Opt for shorter showers over long baths. Reuse water to water plants and lawn. Watch the amount of water you and your family use. Try cooking methods that don't require much water. And if you have a vehicle, avoid washing it regularly. Remember, water is as important as the air we breathe. So conserve our water, conserve our life. Before departing for the BRICS summit on the weekend, Prime Minister Andrew Holness had a busy work schedule. He attended the local governance conference and was in Parliament to provide an update on critical matters. See now what he had to say at those stops. Coming up in Jamaica House Weekly, Zones of special operations extended for Mount Salem and Denham Town. Prime Minister calls for greater accountability and an increase in efficiency within local government and departs for the African continent. These and other stories come your way next. Prime Minister Andrew Holness is currently in Namibia for the first official state visit by a Jamaican head of government to that country. Mr. Holness is accompanied by Culture Minister Olivia Grange, Dr. Julius Garvey and officials from the Foreign Affairs Ministry. While in Namibia, the Prime Minister is expected to hold bilateral talks on visa exemption, culture and youth development, as well as sign memoranda of understanding on sport and political cooperation. He will have discussions with the Namibian private sector and tour the nation's port authority. Talks will also be had with the Jamaican and Caribbean nationals living in Namibia. And Prime Minister Holness will participate in the renaming of a street in the country's capital in honor of Marcus Mazaya Garvey, Jamaica's first national hero. While on the African continent, Mr. Holness will participate in the 10th BRICS Summit being held in Johannesburg, South Africa. As chairman of CARICOM, the Prime Minister will bring regional perspectives to the BRICS plenary session and the BRICS Plus meeting. The BRICS nations are Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. For this year's summit, the BRICS states are joined by the UN Secretary General, Jamaica, Argentina, Indonesia, Egypt, and Turkey. 
Prime Minister Holness will also hold bilateral talks with leaders of the BRICS countries and invited states. During his official working visit to South Africa, Mr. Holness will be joined by Minister of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, Kamina Johnson-Smith. Before his departure, the Prime Minister sought and secured extensions for the zones of special operations in Mount Salem and Denham Town. At last Tuesday's parliamentary sitting, Mr. Holness said the zones were having a spin-off positive effect on national security across the island. As a point of fact, there are overall reductions in homicides and particularly firearm-related incidents. The 60-day extensions begin after the current operation expires on September 4 for Mount Salem and August 16 for Denham Town. This will be the sixth extension for the Mount Salem zone and the fifth for Denham Town. The House of Representatives also approved an extension of the state of public emergency in St. James, which would otherwise have come to an end on August 6. Last Tuesday also found Prime Minister Holness in Montego Bay for the opening ceremony of the inaugural local governance conference. While there, he pledged central government support for strengthening accountability systems at local authorities. Asserting that local government institutions have a direct impact on citizens' quality of life, Mr. Holness said his administration would ensure that they operate at the highest standards. The accountability goes through several phases. The, the ultimate phase is sanction. That if something goes wrong in the administration of the delegated authority that you have, you have an obligation to re report, but you also have a duty to correct and to prevent the reoccurrence of the error or maladministration. Also at the conference, Prime Minister Holness said he would be examining the building approvals and permits process to reduce delay and increase efficiency. He also cautioned local authorities to desist from exerting what he referred to as a territorial nature when issuing building approvals and permits, causing delays which he said hinder growth targets. And I'm absolutely committed to the process of getting government efficient. So I'm taking this opportunity to raise my concern to the local government institutions that we cannot allow internal territorial behavior to slow up national progress. The Prime Minister implored the officers to use the application management and data automation Amanda system, a software designed to track and manage the development application process. We can't spend all this money to put in place a system, to use a technology-generated um, supported system, and then we don't use it. And Prime Minister Andrew Holness called on municipal corporations to train community members to become disaster first responders. The Prime Minister, who is chair of the National Disaster Risk Management Council, recommended that young people through the HOPE program and other entities are engaged to assist in times of disasters. No matter how the government puts out its national campaign, the power of the councillor sitting down with his voters and explaining to them the dangers that they face and having locally structured programs to facilitate their movement, there is nothing more powerful than that. Back at his office, Prime Minister Holness convened a meeting to discuss developments in the formulation of a policy to treat with plastics. He also chaired a meeting of the National Partnership Council. In addition to receiving updates from the Urban Development Corporation, Mr. Holness was presented with a report on how to reduce violence against women and children. The report was compiled by a working group from the Partnership for a Prosperous Jamaica. And that's all the stories coming out of the office of the Prime Minister this past week. Be sure to join us next time for more updates. Morning, morning, morning. Terrible storms, drought, food shortages. Climate change is real. We can't stop it, but we can slow it down. Conserve water. Plant trees, recycle, practice rainwater harvesting, 
use good agricultural practices. Contact the Ministry of Water, Land, Environment and Climate Change at 906-0724 or visit the Ministry's website. In building a disaster resilient country, a multi-pronged approach is necessary and that includes the education sector. The Jamaica Fire Brigade is collaborating with primary schools to equip children with the skills to prepare, prevent and survive a disaster. Let's see how the future leaders are catching on to the idea of disaster preparedness. Move to right in threes. Right turn. Move to left in threes. Squad will retire. Left turn. A ball time. This is not training for the cadet corps. There is a new co-curricular club in schools, the Fire Wardens Club. The Jamaica Fire Brigade has embarked on a new initiative. It involves children and is being implemented in schools across the country. The initiative is similar to that of many other school-based co-curricular programs. The only difference? This club reinforces the importance of disaster preparedness, management and restoration. The main aim is to reduce the country's susceptibility to significant damage from natural and man-made disasters. Ready? Down. Up. What to do if you close our entire? The program is now being implemented in schools across the country since its inception at institutions in St. Catherine in 2017. And you are frightened too. When I showed you the video, yes. did you see where the road split? Yes. And you saw cars going down into the between the Yes. We initially started with a quiz competition that went on to the primary school. So we realized that we needed something a little more tangible where we can actually have the fire wardens club in the school. The motto of the club is We are preparing these students so that whenever there's a disaster, they will be ready to help within the schools, home, and churches. So we would teach them to be ready when there's an earthquake, so they would know the, 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 the procedure, they would know the drill. We prepare them to help their schoolmates if somebody got injured and need to be moved from one place to the other. If there's a fire, we also taught them about the bucket brigade. They can get some water. You might have known that there are times when children are trapped, children are also burnt in fires. Now, if these children were taught and have some idea of what to do, the possibility that they could have helped themselves. Within the schools, a teacher is assigned to the club and for that purpose is given the title of a superintendent. Our students are very enthusiastic about the club and they get involved in many different activities as it pertains to knowing and disseminating information about disasters and disaster mitigation. One of the best agents for information are children and parents respond to children. So when the children know certain things about how to manage disasters, what are some of the right things to do, they can help to inform their parents, and in turn, the parents will inform the community members to respond. And in a community like Portmore, where there are so many potential disasters waiting to happen, it is important that Greater Portmore, at the schools in Greater Portmore, know about fire wardens club and become involved in it. Fire wardens clubites are also engaged in humanitarian activities, visiting children's and nursing homes. I just love how they do things. You have to do them proper and if you don't do them proper, sometimes you get kicked out of the club. The fire wardens club is very fun and I get to do drills like fire safety, earthquake, tsunamis and 
fire drill because it helps us to blow out fire. The fire warden club teaches us to do a drill, teach us when you to do to what to do when your clothes is on fire. Stop, drop, cover your face and roll. It's a great club to join and I love it because you have fun and it's helping your community and schools to, to raise disaster awareness. If someone's house is being flooded out, I can help them by doing check, take them out of the house and take out the good stuff like the birth, like the birth papers and the passports. Loss of life and property as a result of natural and man-made disasters should be minimized as the Fire Wardens Club expands and more children get involved. It is basically the first line of contact that the people within the community have with the authority. It is indeed important in considering like our garbage collection in terms of our link with JPS and other entities. The people in the community have that direct contact with the local government authority through like the councillors and other persons from the various municipal corporations. There's a need for local government so we can have a grassroots approach. Um, to governance so that persons who are really impacted by um, decisions made by the policymakers can have a say in the process. So it's necessary because it's closer to the people on the ground in the communities so they have a more active role in governance and the decisions that are made for them. The local authority, local government is important to the communities on a whole to assist with the social issues of communities, parochial, um, cemeteries, other, other local entities that need assistance, the local authority is there and is geared with the responsible and, and accountable persons who can deal with these issues. Local government is practically the branch, you would say, of higher government and normally the MPs would not really know what is going on, I would say, in the wider communities. So local government would give them a better understanding of what is happening through the councillors and through persons that were there. The National Task Force Against Trafficking in Persons observes Trafficking in Persons Week, July 22 to 28, under the theme From Victim to Survivor, The Hard Road to Recovery. The first international conference on human trafficking will be held at Milia Braco Triloni, July 25 and 26, with 120 delegates and presenters from the local and international community. You too can join us on Facebook at Loop Jamaica, Twitter at min underscore of underscore justice, and Instagram at Loop Jamaica to benefit from the presentations and participate participate in the discussions. Join Jamaica's campaign to eradicate human trafficking. Spot them, stop them, report them. A message from the National Task Force Against Trafficking in Persons. This program and others can be viewed on our YouTube page. You can also visit our website and other social media platforms to stay in the know on matters of national importance. And of course, do join us daily on this station for the latest installment of Jamaica Magazine. Until next time, I'm Adrian Atkinson. On behalf of the entire team here at the GIS, thanks for watching. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.